My guest today is Mark P. Mills. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, uh, the faculty fellow at uh, Northwestern University's uh, great McCormick School of Engineering. I'm a partner in a uh, private equity venture fund. We focus on uh, energy technology, broadly speaking, but heavily in the oil and gas business as well. And you can see from the first slide that since I've written another book, and it's only about a year old, you have to keep promoting the book. <laughs> so it's it's a sort of a stealth energy book, if you like. Anyway, uh, the book's about technology, and there's a lot about energy in the book because it's impossible to do anything in civilization. In fact, the universe doesn't exist but for the existence of energy. So energy's to say energy central is uh, a, a a tautology. It's it's everything. But we. You know, it's an interesting thing about energy domains, and this is a a, a technical and philosophical point. Uh, and I begin here for an obvious reason, given what's being said and done in the world these days, is that humans are, and innovators have been much better in inventing ways to use energy than to produce it. We we find far more ways to use it than we have found new ways to produce it. So the revolutions that really matter, in a sense, are the revolutions in innovation and machines services that consume energy. Revolutions matter in the uh, broad sense, that is, if we can change how we supply energy, it's meaningful because you can't do the things with the machines that we need to provide all the services that humanity needs, wants, and aspires to if you don't have the energy to build them and run them. So it's there's a virtuous circle that can be destructively broken by bad energy policies. Maybe that seems obvious. And I begin with this slide because to make the statement that there was no demand for energy to run cars until the invention of the car is obvious. There was no demand for energy to fly airplanes commercially until the invention of the airplane. There was no demand to fabricate pharmaceuticals until the invention, development of the pharmaceutical industry, chemistry, broadly speaking, and molecular biology, that whole domain. Similarly, there was no energy needed to make and operate computers until the invention of the computer. But in my book, what I've done, and I'll get to this point in a little bit, but what I've done is map out a, a taxonomy of how these innovations happen, whether there's more of them coming. I think there are, so I'll explain in a few minutes. And there's a pattern to this, which is relevant to energy forecasting with respect to demand. And this is where I think we have a disconnect going on in the broad public debate over energy. There's an awful lot of discussion about, you know, quote unquote, revolutions in energy supply. There aren't any. Now, there's far less discussion about revolutions in energy demand. And guessing the future demand of energy is uh, critical because if we think there are no new innovations, no new needs to use energy to produce and operate things, then you might you might be estimating or guesstimating the future demand for energy incorrectly, which which is consequential economically and socially. The pattern I, I want to point out is that the timeline between the invention of a new energy consuming device or idea, the time from that to the development of the first commercially useful products and services that begin to enter enter the markets at scale, the time for that's about two to two 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 decades, 20, 25 years. This was true for the car. It's about 25 years after the invention of the car, the internal combustion engine, the Model T came along. The Model T is the iconic pivot in the automotive industry's history when people began to use them at scale. There were hundreds of automobile companies between uh, 1895 and, and uh, 1910 came and went. Millions of cars were produced over that period, but the automotive age really began uh, in the late teens and really the 1920s. And then from that point on, over the next couple decades, the consumption of energy to run cars rose from nearly nothing to today's 25 million barrels per day or so globally for all forms of, of you know, wheeled transportation. Same is true of the airplanes. Well, 25 years after the uh, Wright brothers, before a practical aircraft typ tip, uh, typified by, uh, ironically, the Ford trimotor in the mid-1920s. Uh, Same thing in pharmaceuticals, by the way. Pharmaceutical industry's energy consumption per square foot of building is roughly 300% higher than the overall manufacturing energy consumption per square foot. So it's a very energy-intensive industry. Uh, the development of chemistry and making possible pharmaceuticals dates to the um, uh, late 1800s, late 19th century, but it wasn't for nearly 
three decades before a pharmaceutical industry, broadly speaking, the sort of the chemical industry began to mature. And since and from that point forward, we went from nearly nothing, no energy consumed in the production of pharmaceuticals, to something on the order of 50 million barrels per day energy equivalent of energy used to produce pharmaceuticals. And who wouldn't want that? I mean, from painkillers to you know, disease cures, these are the critical industry. Computing the same thing, the first uh, electronic computer was not the ENIAC, uh, it, and it was not the Colossus, which predated the ENIAC in England. It was a computer built in Iowa by two professors in 1936, almost 25 years before the commercial, first commercially useful computer, the UNIVAC, was bought by the Census Bureau. Um, and then from that point forward, we had the great expansion of computing, which today, globally speaking, as an enterprise in energy equivalent terms, is about 10 million barrel per day sector. So yeah, the point of all that is the, the, the products and services associated with these, you know, these four great domains consume a lot of energy. They consume nothing before, before their invention. Uh, and the cost and availability and reliability of energy is extraordinary, extraordinarily important to make these products and services affordable uh, and democratized, if you like. So we we ostensibly have another uh, revolution in energy coming, uh, and I would dare say everyone who's listening to this knows about the claims of the electric vehicle, the EV revolution. We've gone from essentially no electric vehicles. By that I mean, you know, the car, the Tesla. We don't. We're not talking about specialty vehicles like forklifts and um, subway trains. But the EV is ostensibly a revolution, we're being told, and we're constantly, uh, the word revolution has been devalued <laughs> in common lexicon because it's said so often in clickbait. But it is a big deal, right? The uh, We've gone from essentially no uh, EVs on the world's roads to almost 12 million uh, now. That, that seems like a, quote, exponential increase. Uh, it's not an energy revolution in the sense, obviously, of energy supply. It's ostensibly a revolution in how we use energy, you know, switching from combustion fuels, liquids to uh, batteries. This is not a great switch, by the way, which I'll get to in a section. And I'm going to you know, focus on EVs here uh, more than energy supply, which I'll get to, because it epitomizes the, the uh, misunderstandings and confusions uh, that are being promulgated with respect to so-called energy revolutions the hyperbole around accelerating change, uh, overnight uh, you know, uh, revolutions, uh, the hyperbole of this changes everything in the clickbait of our times. So we've, yes, we've gone from, <clears throat> excuse me, no EVs to almost 12 million in the world today, most of which, by the way, 60% of which are in China, which is which is relevant because, because China's electric grid is uh, two thirds coal fired. So with respect to those who think that this is a, a switch from oil to magic uh, windmills and solar panels. Uh, it, in most of the world, it's a switch from uh, oil to coal, but uh, a detail, as they say. Uh, and China is not backing off coal, uh, as anyone who follows this issue knows. In fact, China, a couple of weeks ago, withdrew from the Paris Accord and continued to promote an astonishing expansion in the uh, construction of coal power plants in its country for the next 20 years. But con to context, revolutions in car models because an electric vehicle, an electric car is still a car. It's not it's not like the transition from a horse and buggy to car. It's a it's equivalent to finding new food for the horse. Uh, food the food source matters. Uh, where horses got their food and it was inexpensive or expensive and nutritious that mattered. Uh, going from a horse to a car was a big deal. Changing the food for the car, it's still a car. It is consequential, which I'll talk about in a minute, where the fuel comes from, where the food for the car comes from. But in terms of the magnitude of the velocity of the change and consumer adoption of a new model of car, because the EV is fundamentally a new model of car, just like the SUV was a new model of car. The minivan was a new model of car. The sports car for everyday people, as opposed to the very wealthy, was a new model of car. You know, the, the record for consumer enthusiasm for adoption of a new model of car uh, is, is uh, the Ford, Ford Mustang, 1964. The introduction of that new model of car went from zero to one million sold in 18 months. 
When Elon Musk introduced the Tesla S sedan, it was a big deal. He went from zero to one million sold in 92 months. Now, this I happen to admire what uh, Elon Musk has done with Tesla and with SpaceX. And his ventures are impressive. He's an impressive leader and an engineer, and uh, arguably the uh, Tesla, up until very recently, had the best engineered battery pack in the automotive sector. But zero to a million sold in 92 months is not exactly as fast as zero to a million sold in 18 months. So the consumer adoption rate for the uh, uh, everyday everyday sports car uh, blows the doors off, no pun intended, <laughs> the adoption rate for EVs and Teslas. And here we have sort of a finger on a scale thing to, to point out with respect to the world numbers. You know, this graph shows you the IEA data and, you know, Bloomberg New Energy Finance data for the growth in the in, in adoption and purchase of electric vehicles. But that that data set that you see that's constantly uh, repeated around the uh, social media and uh, and the energy press includes plug-in hybrids, which is a finger on the scale with respect to the so-called EV revolution for the obvious reasons. Those who would want to, and the 12 states that have proposed to, and dozens of countries that have proposed to ban internal combustion engines would also ban plug-in hybrids because that, by definition, the hybrid has an internal combustion engine. So roughly a third of all those vehicles are plug-in hybrids. If you uh, count only battery electric vehicles, all battery power, the number's smaller, but it's still a big number. You know, it's still it's still approaching you know eight or nine million. It'll probably be ten million this year. So it's it is a big deal. Right, For lots of EVs in the world. But what's what's what we have is a uh, a set of myths that are being promulgated about the EV. The, the myths. Uh, fall into a very simplistic set of buckets you hear repeated all the time. Electric vehicles are simpler. Electric vehicles are going to be cheaper or already cheaper. Electric vehicles will be cheaper to operate, and electric vehicles will radically cut carbon dioxide emissions. Now, I'll, I'll deal with each of those claims in order. EVs are simpler. Well, no, they're not. They've just a, they're just a swap of complexity. EVs are a different model. We've swapped the complexity in the propulsion system for the complexity in the fuel system. In the conventional vehicle, the power system, the, elect the electro, uh, rather the physical chemistry of combustion is achieved through a, an internal combustion engine that typically has thousands of parts. True, that's a complicated machine. It's very inexpensive to make. We're really good at it. It's made mostly out of steel and iron and some aluminum. Uh, and that's cheap metals, huge production capacities, very high quality. The fuel system is extremely simple. A tank containing a liquid with a single moving pump, sing, single moving part electric pump. Go to an EV, we swap the complexities. We have for the drive system, an electric motor with a single moving part. Most EVs have two motors that people want to buy. Some have three. So two, you know, two moving parts. But the fuel system, the electrochemical battery is a complex multi-thousand part machine. It contains tens of thousands of welds, cooling systems, uh, safety systems, electronic control systems, um, structural systems. It is a complex machine that wears out at the molecular level, just as the physical chemistry of an internal combustion engine machine wears out at the molecular level. They both have the same challenges and reliability of manufacturing and quality assurance and quality control. In fact, I would say the challenges have been largely conquered in terms of safety, reliability, and uh, manufacturing efficacy with respect to the physical chemistry of internal combustion engines, it has not been conquered with respect to the complexities of multi-thousand part uh, electro electrochemical battery systems. This is it, this is where we're seeing a battery fires uh, because it's it's a difficult problem to get to high volume high high reliability production for things that involve thousands of parts. Engineers will get there. They're not there yet with most with most systems. Um, the other trope is, of course, that EVs are new and revolutionary and are exponentially getting better. And internal combustion engine technology is old technology. It's tired. It can't get better. It's at the end of its useful life. There's no more innovation. Well, that's actually not true. The inverse is the case. Um, battery chemistry is near the asymptote in terms of what we can do in terms of radical improvements in it. It can, you know, battery chemistry is getting incrementally better each year, you know, five, 10 percent, maybe. Uh, in some cases, less than that. In some cases, the improvements are negative. That is, 
it, to improve safety, you lose efficacy and energy conversion. Internal combustion engines are nowhere near their end of useful life. Um, this is a, a forecast based on known technologies for the reduction in energy and therefore CO2 per mile for known available and manufacturable, manufacturable internal combustion engines. Put differently, uh, there is a technical capacity to improve by at least 50% the uh, energy efficacy of internal combustion engines. There is no road to make electric motors 50% more efficient. They're already 90% efficient. They can't get much more efficient. There is no path to make batteries at scale get 50% better than they are today. They will eventually get 50% better, but no, but at, at a no faster pace at best than internal combustion engines. And in terms of complexity, by the way, there are several designs for internal combustion engines that have only a few moving parts, not thousands. In fact, there are several designs for internal combustion engines that have as few moving parts as an electric motor. So the, the trope that there is an inherent advantage in electrochemistry and electric motors over physical uh, combustion chemistry and internal combustion engines is just that, it's a trope. It's not, it's not true. But it is true, and before I get on to the third uh, claim, which is an inter uh, converting from internal combustion engines to EVs will radically cut CO2 emissions, the, the factor that matters for the transportation market for personal mobility, which is a new euphemism for personal vehicles, and they're using that euphemism because, they, because some people think that uh, millennials and Gen Zs are going to uh, grow up uh, and evolve into uh, taking scooters and bicycles for their personal mobility needs instead of being protected inside uh, from weather and accidents inside of a car with four wheels. Uh, this is not only not going to happen, it's not happening. The inverse is happening. The relevant uh, trends that impact claims about an all EV future really attach to two things that are particularly important. One is the size of vehicles that people pr prefer to drive by virtue of their purchase choices, and how far people t tend to drive in any given day. In other words, this, this impacts two things. How, in the EV world, how big the battery is and how easy it is to refuel the battery. This graph on your left is the IEA's data tracking the share of all new car sales that are SUVs globally. The takeaway here is pretty obvious. Everywhere in the world, people are increasingly buying SUVs, big vehicles. We all know why people are buying big vehicles. They buy it for convenience, comfort, safety. Uh, and that's not a trend that's just isolated to the United States. Uh, it's global. The share of all vehicles that were SUVs 10 years ago globally was about 18%. About a third of all vehicles purchased last year in the world were SUVs. In the United States, it's half. In the US, if we add in pickup trucks, which is the go-to vehicle for driving to the grocery store, you know, in a lot of in a lot of American states, not just not just the great the heartland. Uh, you get the seventy-five percent. Uh, that's 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 relevant because bigger vehicles consume more energy. Uh, that means if you're making them electric, you need big batteries. It also means if they're gasoline powered, they can they typically consume more gasoline than doing the same driving with the same engine with a lighter vehicle. The IEA points out that uh, by twenty forty the the increased share of SUVs in the world's roads will consume a quantity of an extra quantity of oil equal to the quantity of oil that will be saved by having 150 million EVs on the roads. The other thing that's going on in the United States in particular is a expansion into uh, ex-urban, suburban, and rural counties. We've been told for a long time that uh, the world is urbanizing. This is true globally for for poor countries. It's not true in the United States. It's, it's very interesting data. This comes uh, from the Census Bureau, which uh, and there are a number of studies on this, which I will confess, I was surprised to find these data sets when I was doing research for my book, looking at uh, macroeconomic trends with respect to where people are living, what kind of houses they're buying in America and around the world. The net migration uh, out of urban core counties, you know, measured by zip codes, and moving into suburban counties and ex-urban counties, there was a, a, a reversal of the urbanization trend that began over 10 years ago, pre-COVID. You see in this graph on the right that there's been a, a continual slow uh, exit from urban counties and a continual uh, movement to suburban and ex-urban and some rural counties. Of course, that accelerated in 2020 with the great lockdowns where 
about a third of all of Americans moved, the biggest single migration of American population in history. And maybe half those people move back to urban areas, but that would, doesn't change the fact that there's been a, a, a migration to exurban, suburban, and rural counties. The obvious thing about those uh, regions for people living is that they drive greater distances. They are fewer sources of mass transit. There aren't typically any buses. There certainly aren't any uh, subways and, and rail lines. So people uh, drive further and they... Uh, don't have other options other than driving, and they are choosing to live there. The other thing that's going on, which is kind of interesting, is that the share of people who are not telecommuting, everybody's read a lot about telecommuting that allows people to, you know, Zoomify themselves to work like we're doing right now. Uh, the share of people doing that has risen, it was accelerated, obviously, by the lockdowns. But the other thing that's been going on is the share of so-called super, super commuters, people who move into suburban, exurban, and rural zones and still drive to their job distances of more than 90 miles. That share of people who do that has increased threefold faster than the overall share of the workforce in the last decade. Those are people that drive long, millions, this is why millions, millions of citizens are driving long distances to get to their jobs. There are a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's purely voluntary. They like to live in suburban or exurban or rural counties. Some of it is forced by the cost of housing. The people whose jobs don't allow them to buy homes uh, close in and they move further out. That has profound implications for the kind of vehicles people drive, hence vehicles that have longer range, more comfort, all those features that are pretty, pretty obvious. So if they choose to buy an EV, if we choose to manufacture an EV rather than an internal combustion engine, we know two things. Uh, we know that obviously it's going to use electricity, which I'll get to in a minute. And uh, we have to talk about um, where the electricity comes from, the charging infrastructure, all that stuff. But it, excuse me, it also means that you're manufacturing a vehicle, self-evidently, with a battery instead of an internal combustion engine. An internal combustion engine, to say it again, is uh, is a uh, largely steel and iron, uh, a little bit of nickel, not, not much in the way of exotic metal, metals making it. The electric vehicle is made. I mean, you think in mineral metals term, mainly from copper and a, and a, a, a soup, if you like, a suite of a whole set of other uh, metals and minerals: lithium, obviously, nickel, manganese, and cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, graphite, zinc, some rare earths. Uh, and if you look at the quantity of these metals, these uh, unusual minerals, if you like, iron ore is really common and nothing unusual about it. The quantity of uh, so-called rare metals or energy min minerals that are needed to make a single EV is roughly uh, 300 to 500% greater than the quantity of those metal metals and minerals needed to make a conventional car. Uh, this is in IEA data. So, I mean, put in and, and put in a sort of uh, environmental, economic, and energy terms, this is the sort of the, as the lawyers would say, the dispositive fact. It takes about 500,000 pounds of digging up of the earth mining to get the minerals you need to build one EV battery. Now that that has relevance in, in many ways. It's relevant both to the economic cost of the battery and it's also relevant to the environmental footprint of the battery. And it's relevant to the future environmental footprint and economic cost of the battery, which which I'll get to. But the 500,000 pounds of digging up of the earth is determined is, is a consequence of the fact that the metals like nickel and copper chromium and molybdenum exist in very low concentrations in ore compared to iron ore. Uh, give you a, a sense of perspective, a typical uh, copper ore grade is below 1%. That is, you have to dig up 100 pounds of ore to get one pound of copper. Typical iron ore grade could be as high as 50%. So you only dig up a couple pounds of the of earth to get to one pound of iron ore. Uh, this profoundly changes the amount of work you're doing, energy use is on a machinery you need to uh, manufacture each electric vehicle. That shows up in, in, the, in the third trope about EVs, it's CO2 footprint. So the, remember the trope one is that they're inherently simpler, they're not, they're just differently complex. Trope, trope two is that they're inherently better, uh, they're not, they're just a different model of car. With, other, with features that internal combustion engines uh, don't, don't necessarily have and vice versa. But the claim this will lead to radical reductions in CO2 emissions 
is entirely anchored on a, a myth that, uh, if you like, that they're zero emissions vehicles and get labeled such. Uh, you know, obviously, everybody knows if you plug an EV in, it depends on when and where you plug it in, uh, what the emissions are from the vehicle to recharge it. Uh, put differently, simplistically, internal combustion engines mainly emit uh, carbon dioxide or anything when they're operating. EVs mainly emit uh, carbon dioxide when they're parked, when they're not being used. So simplistically, you park it to refuel it, and before you ever drive it, you you find CO two emissions from the manufacturing of of the vehicle. So remember the five hundred thousand pounds of digging of the earth to make one EV battery. That means that you're using large equipment to access, dig up the earth, crush rocks, grind rocks. This all takes energy. And then you use chemicals to melt the rocks, dissolve them to extract and refine the minerals that you're targeting, all of which takes energy. If you count that energy up in tons of CO2 emitted per car battery, you get a graph like this. This comes from uh, Volkswagen, where they were comparing, in one case, the diesel golf, and the other case, a gasoline golf, but they're very similar to uh, a battery-powered Golf, a small car. And uh, what, they, what they did was quite honest. They published the study. They have it up at their website for the last six years. They pulled it down earlier this year because they stopped selling the EV Golf. They're, they moved up to bigger EVs. But the facts don't change. It takes energy to manufacture a conventional vehicle, in this case, a diesel car. And that's, that means your CO2 emitted before the vehicle is driven. That's the orange line. So by the time the vehicle is delivered to the driveway in this particular model, it's emitted five tons of CO2 to fabricate it and deliver it to your driveway. The EV in this case has emitted uh, 12 tons of CO2 before you drive it. Uh, that's because of the fabrication associated with the battery, the digging up, processing. And then, of course, what you see is that every mile you drive the diesel vehicle, you emit CO2. And the important thing here is that it doesn't matter where you buy the gasoline or diesel. It doesn't matter when you burn it. It doesn't matter where it's made the emissions of CO2 per mile driven are pretty much the same. With an EV, it's really different. Depends when and where you charge it. Now, this model is assuming an average CO2 emissions from the average EU grid. If you happen to charge your uh, EV at uh, when it's a windy day and wind is 90% of the local power provided in that particular state or region, you're not emitted anything for that fill up. If you happen to charge it at night in Germany, where there's a lot of coal plants now running or in, in, in uh, China, you're recharging it with coal-fired power, self-evidently. The specific time and location of when you fuel a vehicle profoundly impacts what the emissions actually are. So these calculations are really, in a sense, illustrative, but silly. The diesel one, we do know exactly what the emissions are. The EV, you're just guessing, frankly, using an average as a guess, because it doesn't mean what's, that's what's really happening, because it really depends on consumer behavior and local grids, time of day, time of year. In doing that, the obvious thing you see here is that over the life of the vehicle, uh, for the first 60,000 miles of driving a small vehicle with uh, with a small battery, now this is a battery half of the standard size that most people buy, it, for the first 60,000 miles of driving, the, the diesel has emitted less CO2 than the EV because of the front loading of carbon dioxide emissions to make the EV. At the end of the useful life of the vehicles, the, the EV in this model, assuming an average you know, EU grid of emissions, yeah, it does emit a little less CO2, it's about 15 to 20% less. This is not zero. This is not a, a radical reduction. And it might, it might be zero, depending on when you charge the vehicle. It might be a little more than 20%. If, you're only, if you somehow only recharge your vehicle when it's ideally uh, lowest to CO2 emissions. And, but keep in mind, if I consider the vehicle that most people are buying, that the EVs that most people are buying, which is not the small Golf with a hat, with a half size battery, if you buy the vehicles like a Tesla S or a Ford Mustang Mach E with a standard battery twice the size, then the size, then the front loaded CO2 emissions are double by definition. So you take this graph, take that, that yellow line, and you move it up 2x. Uh, put differently, that, that would mean that at the end of its useful life, the EV will have emitted more CO2 than just driving the uh, diesel vehicle. Volvo did a similar uh, study for their uh, midsize SUV, and they compared. This is a, 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 you know, a simplification of their graph. They did a, they did a pretty good job. Their battery is a little bigger than 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 the Golf, and it's still smaller than the Tesla S and the Mach E and the vehicles that are people buying. So you can see that their CO two emissions for the EV before it's driven 
are higher than the Golf, or up to almost 24 tons of CO2 emitted before you drive the vehicle. And uh, then they compared the uh, CO2 emissions for that electric vehicle on the average global grid kilowatt hour, which has more coal in it, versus the average EU grid, which has less coal and more wind and solar. Then again, you see the pattern. Uh, if you drive the uh, EV, this uh, a battery-powered uh, Volvo SUV in Europe, for the first 45, 50,000 miles, you've emitted more CO2 than if you just driven the gasoline-powered SUV. Uh, on the global grid, that the number goes up to 80,000 miles of driving before you've before you're uh, net saving any CO2. Now, this kind of graphs uh, give the illusion of precision. To be clear here, we do know precisely how much CO2 internal combustion engines emit because we know exactly how much gasoline you, you burn. It's not there's not there's no mystery to it. You put a gallon of gas in, you burn a gallon of gas. This amount of CO2 emitted, emitted per burning a gallon of gasoline is very well known, very precise. Uh, essentially invariant, very slightly with temperature. Uh, but that's not true with the EV, and especially not true with manufacturing the EV's battery. It, the batteries are bigger. This is a graph from the Wall Street Journal. So the small batteries that are being used in all these studies and being published widely, the claim, including by the IEA, that EVs emit less CO2 are all based on small batteries. As, whereas the fact is, most, not only are most of the vehicles being purchased uh, have have batteries twice the size of the small batteries in these models and claims, but the batteries are getting bigger. This is a trend line in the average size, the medium, medium, medium and max size batteries in EVs that are actually being purchased by people in the United States. I mean, you can look at this and what you can see is essentially the size of the battery in a very few years has doubled, which means that CO2 emissions produ to produce the battery are doubled and it's not being counted in the claims. But if you did that, if we, we look at real battery sizes, and if we look at the real variables, and these are these are the sort of called the known unknowns, we know that uh, CO2 emissions per ton of copper, per ton of manganese, per ton of lithium varies wildly depending on where you get the material. And it varies wildly depending on where you refine the material. All metals have to be refined. China refines something on the order of 50 to 80% of all the energy minerals from cobalt to manganese, to lithium that are used for EV batteries. China's grid is coal-fired. If you include those factors, which are real-world factors, in the upstream CO2 emissions for manufacturing an EV, you get a graph that looks like this. See the dotted lines? Is that sort of the baseline that I had in the earlier graph for the Volvo SUV? So assume a vehicle like a small to mid sized SUV, uh, and you look at the internal combustion engine baseline and say, well, you could buy uh, an SUV with an internal combustion engine had a better fuel efficiency. Those vehicles exist. They cost a little more. And you get the red line. You could actually reduce your CO2 or a footprint or your total gasoline consumption over the life of the vehicle by 20% with readily available uh, uh, options in the internal combustion world. So that the red line. The green line illustrates the real-world variables, not the maximum but a higher end of the range of real world variables in manufacturing, processing, and mining, and refining materials to make an EV. And then run it on the EU grid and you get the green line. What this tells you is that in this scenario, which is not a figure on the scale scenario, this is the kind of reality that exists in the world that we live in, the EV always emits more carbon dioxide than the, the best available internal combustion engines for a comparable vehicle. Whether it's that high or higher or slightly lower, the key point of a recent study that I did called the impossible dream is that no one actually knows. We know what the variables are. We know that the variables are wide. We know that the probability is you're at the higher end is there, but but nobody really knows what their what the actual CO2 emissions are from the vehicles that are manufactured and delivered to consumers. But one thing we do know is that the emissions from uh, manufacturing EV batteries are going to go up and they're going up, not down. The reason that the emissions are gonna go up is because ore grades for the metals that you need are declining. We know that because that's been going on for centuries. This is not a new trend. Uh, everybody in the mining industry uh, knows the simple fact that the average grade of ore for almost every class of mineral, in fact, I think for every class of mineral, has been declining for decades, if not centuries. This is for copper. I'm showing copper here because uh, you can't do anything with wind, solar, and batteries without copper. It's a copper-centric world. The average EV uses three to 400 pounds 
more copper than the average uh, conventional car. Uh, com everything in the, in, in the world of solar power and wind turbines requires copper. Copper ore grades have been in uh, continual decline and are forecast to continually decline. That's the left graph. The right graph shows you the energy cost uh, of extracting copper as ore grades decline. This should not be surprising, right? If the ore grade goes in half, you have to dig up twice as much rock. But what, what is perhaps surprising, it should be if you think through the physical energetics, what goes on in digging it up and grinding uh, ore, is that it's actually nonlinear increase. If you cut the ore grade in half, you don't double the energy use. It goes up, it goes up nonlinearly. This is a logarithmic graph that you're looking at. So what you see is ore grade declines on the x-axis towards the left. The energy consumption of gigajoules per ton rises on the y-axis. Uh, and they again, I'll, I'll remind you, these are this is this is a log log curve. That means by definition, it's a nonlinear increase. Uh, it's an exponential increase, if you like, of energy use uh, per pound of copper access as the ore grades decline. So the IEA knows this, by the way, in their 300 page plus report on energy minerals, they point out in a very elliptical language that the decline in ore grades, uh, could could more than offset the, how do they word this? Uh, the, the exact wording is it says it could offset the uh, emi emi the CO two emissions reductions that might be achieved by building uh, you know running electric vehicles. Could okay it, it not could it will and, and it is and this is this is maybe the single biggest variable that's being utterly ignored uh, as the world expands the demand for metals to produce electric vehicles. Couple more things on EVs, just as a you know, technical physical fact that are being ignored in the uh, claims of reduced carbon dioxide emissions uh, by introducing uh, fleet-wide requirements, if not uh, mandates for using EVs or internal combustion engines. We know for a fact that uh, engines become less efficient uh, as the temperature drops. Uh, but this, this is technical data uh, from, from the technical literature. Um, People who've driven in cold climates. I grew up in Canada, so I'm familiar, personally familiar with this. About a third of Americans live in live in a, in a cold climate in northern in northern latitudes. Engine uh, efficiency declines about five or six percent as temperatures drop from eighty to twenty degrees. Um, okay, that means inversely, you consume five or six percent more fuel, you go the same miles. Uh, batteries uh, over the same temperature range, their uh, their efficiencies drop thirty percent. So. That what that means is that the third of the American population that who drive EVs in northern latitudes will increase their electricity use by thirty percent in, in in winter miles. By the way, that that's just the electrochemical efficiency of the battery. It doesn't count the fact that the battery will have to supply energy to heat the vehicle. In the internal combustion engine model, you get free heat, right? The waste heat's free heat. You heat the heat the cabin up. In the EV, uh, in the winter, you have to use battery electricity to heat the inter interior of the vehicle. And so in, in the real, real world tests, which have been done by you know, Car and Driver Magazine and others and Society of Automotive Engineers, the uh, fuel mileage of an electric vehicle can drop as much as 50% in cold weather. But differently, you double, you double the amount of energy, energy you use per mile, which means that your CO2 footprint went up per mile driving in the cold. So you need to account for that when you do these, these macro calculations. So what I hear when I lay, you know, lay out these sort of physical chemistry facts, which have nothing whatsoever to do with whether EVs are fun to drive, they are, whether they have you know, lip peeling acceleration, they do, whether Teslas are, are nice cars, they are, whether or not a lot of people like to buy EVs, they do, whether there'll be lots more EVs, there will be. This is, this is not a knock on the, on the engineers who make great electric vehicles. I'm just talking about the underlying physical chemistry and physical facts of the realities of how engines and batteries and propulsion systems and mining works. When you point these things out, people typically say, well, the batteries will get better. Battery technology is getting better at an exponential pace. You hear all the time. We have revolutions in batteries, battery breakthroughs. That's the single most common clickbait in social media these days. I lost track of how many times I've seen in any given week, a battery breakthrough. This changes everything. And then the, 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 um, we invoke the tech revolution, the energy tech, a clean tech, and that word tech is being used because it's directly, both implicitly and, ex and explicitly 
invoking Moore's law, the rate at which computer technology and communications technology has gotten better. So we're implying somehow that's, in fact, more than implying, a lot of uh, otherwise serious people are saying, look at the cell phone revolution, look at the computing revolution. For an example, exponential change in technology will happen. Uh, you don't get exponential change in battery technology. It doesn't happen in the physics of the world we live in. This is a graph of what the Moore's law rate would look like for improving the energy density of batteries. The metric that matters to make batteries better is you need fewer pounds of battery to get the same amount of energy. It's called energy density. And uh, the y-axis in this graph, instead of being in, in watt hours per kilogram, which is how you would measure density, what I did is I compared the weight of an internal combustion engine and a gasoline tank with the weight of an electric motor and a battery. So the propulsion and fuel systems combined have a weight. That's your energy density, storing fuel and converting it into propulsion. Uh, the electric vehicle today, its motor plus its battery, provides an energy density of about 5% of an internal combustion engine's gasoline plus, its, uh, inter plus, plus the engine, 5%. Now, it used to only be 2%. So pre-lithium battery, in the very er first lithium batteries, when they became commercially available in the early 1990s, it was only 2% as good as internal combustion engine plus gasoline. You can see that it, it more than doubled and almost tripled. It actually had not an exponential growth, but a very, very dramatic, excuse me, dramatic linear growth to the roughly when the uh, Tesla S sedan was introduced. And that's no coincidence that Elon Musk introduced the Tesla sedan uh, contemporaneous with the, uh, the commercialization and then physical improvement of lithium battery manufacturing. But you'll notice this is this is a plot of real batteries uh, sold into the market, the average battery sold into the, uh, into the market uh, since 1992. What you can see is that there wasn't any dramatic improvement in lithium battery uh, energy density. It, it, it crept up until about 2018, 2019, and then it started creeping back down with the increased use of batteries that are less prone to burn, and lithium iron phosphate batteries and other, other formulations. To, to improve safety. The safety and um, energy uh, uh, density are sort of inversely related. <laughs> the more energy dense batteries tend to be a little harder to control and make sure they're safe. The less energy dense batteries tend to be easier to control and make safe. You know, we'll keep improving that over time. DOE has a goal. You can see it's the dotted line here. The point is the DOE goal doesn't even get you to 10% of the energy density of an internal combustion engine. It's not a Moore's law rate change. If batteries could follow a Moore's law rate of change, like computing, we would soon have a battery the size of a peanut that you could charge once and run your car for the life of the vehicle. That'll never happen in the universe we live in. It's a totally different magisteria. But what, what will happen is that we're going to have to build up the grid to charge these batteries in ways that are just absolutely astonishing. So back to just, you know, this is electricity 101. If you, want, if you want to charge a battery overnight and you have three cars and one of them is in your garage, you have a seven kilowatt, uh, six to eight hour charger, great. If you want to charge it on the road, you're going to be using a 150 to 300 kilowatt charger to be able to, to refuel your vehicle in 20 to 40 minutes. But keep in mind, the typical refuel time for a gasoline tank is about three to four minutes. So you're going to need uh, to increase by four to five fold the wait time to get your fuel, or you have to increase the number of fueling stations, pump, and pump ports, by four to five fold. And each one of them is going to be 200 to 300 kilowatts. Kilowatts. Uh, this is a graph that was generated by uh, a utility, Northern Grid, uh, in order to show uh, to show the electric power demand of a single fueling station on the highway that would be powered with superchargers to refuel cars and trucks. And then what they did is they compared the power demand of a single fueling station to the power demand of a stadium or a town or, or a large industrial plant, a small town. A typical fueling station today has the uh, electric demand of a 7-Eleven, because that's essentially what it is. A 7-Eleven, if you like, it's a convenience store, plus a bunch of tiny electric pumps that pump the gasoline out of the tank in the ground. If you convert that into a bunch of 200 to 300 kilowatt per fuel port station, you end up with a steel mill's worth of electric demand per fueling station on the, along the highways. This will require, never mind the cost of the, of the charger, this will require grid upgrades equivalent to uh, putting uh, 
uh, distribution systems and transformers for every fueling station equal to doing that for, for steel mills or a small town. In dollar terms, uh, if you imagined the uh, fueling system of the United States with gasoline being replaced with uh, superchargers, you need to spend somewhere on the order of $500 billion to $1 trillion in distribution upgrades. Um, this is not in anybody's plans. It's a, a far larger number than the $7 billion is being imagined right now to be spent on subsidizing on-road charging. The on-road charging, of course, has a cost. Uh, if you set aside the cost in sort of $100 billion terms, but just impute it in terms of what I'm going to have to charge you to charge your vehicle, actually charge you. Uh, that's the um, what, what you what you already know is that the uh, cost per fill up for the supercharger, and we know this because this is true in Europe today. It's also true in the United States. The cost per fill up per mile of driving with a supercharger is greater than the cost of fill up with gasoline today. This is before we really build a network out and spend more capital, and that capital have to be recovered in, in, either in taxes, which are the subsidies, or by charging you when you fill your vehicle up. This is a study that was done looking at the, the real world of economics uh, where you would charge people what it costs to fill their vehicle, which is the fuel. The left one is the gasoline, and the right one is the electricity, including the capital costs being amortized for a supercharger. This particular economic analysis also valued people's time, because most of us value our time, and put an economic value on the time you spend fueling. So the longer you spend fueling, the more of the imputed value of your time. So what you see is with a standard DC supercharger, the 40 minutes you spend there as a fueling time valued, and the green is the chart, what you're being charged to fill your tank up in electricity terms with a supercharger. The other ones are obviously depreciation of the vehicle and maintenance insurance. As you go to a, the really fast charger, the extremely fast charger, the fueling time goes down, drops down to about 15 minutes. That's why the small, but the actual cost of the fuel, the supercharger plus the electricity, uh, ex explodes. Put differently, in the real world, uh, in real economic costs, not hidden costs, not subsidized costs, the average electric vehicle to own and operate it the way you would own and operate the average gasoline vehicle for on-road use, not occasional use in your garage, is higher than the cost of an, a gasoline vehicle. I know you all seen these elliptical calculations about the lower cost for maintenance and lower cost for fuel. The maintenance costs are a little lower. That's true. Uh, there's a lot of studies uh, coming out of Europe now that show the maintenance costs aren't dramatically lower than a modern return on combustion engine. A little lower. The insurance costs are actually now found to be higher. This model shows them to be the same. They're higher because when an electric when an electric vehicle's battery is damaged, it's a write off. There's no means to repair it, and especially when they're part of the vehicle frame itself, which increasingly is the case. You can't straighten it out like you can a steel frame. You have to trash the vehicle. So insurers are beginning to increase the insurance costs. So insurance costs are actually higher. Depreciation costs are higher because EVs depreciate faster because people correctly believe the next generation of EV will better, be better, far better than the last one. So it means that it's worth a lot less at resale value than an internal combustion engine of the same age. So even this study understates the, the spread between the costs, that is the higher cost of EVs on the road. So let me finish beating up on EVs with just an observation. There will be lots of more EVs in the world, even without mandates or subsidies. There's there, there's a lots of people who find them fun and interesting. There's a very good utility case for them for occasional use in in town. Where you can you have a garage, which is about a third of American Americans American drivers have a garage. That third and 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 as you can see from this graph, this is census data. <clears throat> there are something on the order of 50 million households with two or three vehicles. Uh, those are candidates for an EV. Uh, replace one of your second or third vehicles with an EV that you can charge overnight conveniently. Uh, very convenient. You don't ever have to go to a gasoline station and drive it around town. You still have one or two other vehicles you can use for long highway runs. If, if you don't want to spend you know, 20 to 40 minutes on a refuel uh, every time you drive, uh, big market. Uh, and that's why in America today, there's fewer than 1 million EVs on the roads, most of them in California, unsurprisingly. That's why EV manufacturers are competing for that 50 million. There's almost 300 million vehicles in America, keep in mind, but trying to get some significant share of that 50 million on, on your side of the ledger, ledger would be really nice. These are mostly luxury vehicles. Most EVs are expensive. EVs are selling in the luxury car category in most of the world outside of China. 
Uh, and this is what's uh, frightened the other automakers. Elon Musk now is the largest luxury vehicle seller in the United States. It's the largest single share of luxury vehicle sales in the United States, full stop. That's why all the other automakers now make, and will continue to make, luxury EVs. Whether they can take in a Elon Musk's market share, we'll see. But that won't change the world. It, won't, it just won't change the world. In fact, let me leave with one last fact about EVs. Assume for the sake of argument, all the hyperbole is correct, that we can make enough EVs fast enough to go from a world with around 8 or 10 million EVs to 200 million EVs. Three, you pick your number, 300 million EVs uh, 10 years from now. That will be in a world that has 1.5 billion vehicles. That will not, that will not eliminate more than 7% of the world's oil consumption. 7%. This is not a revolutionary uh, change in oil demand. It's not an ex existential threat to the oil industry. What is happening, however, is that the cost of batteries and EVs are going up because the cost of the raw materials are going up. This is the bill of materials cost to make a typical EV, which has um, roughly doubled in the uh, last three years. This is, not, this is not a supply chain problem with respect to COVID lockdowns. You'll notice that the, the discontinuity uh, occurs after that. It's not because of the uh, supply chain disruptions, which did have a short-term impact. Uh, you can see a little hiccup on that in this graph on your left. Well, this is a consequence of a simple uh, metric, supply and demand. Uh, 60 to 70% of the cost to make a battery is the cost of the raw materials. As the demand for copper, manganese, lithium, cobalt, graphite rises faster than the supply, the cost of the materials are going up. And as the cost of the materials go up, the cost to make batteries and the cost to make solar panels and the cost of the windmills has been rising, not declining. So um, let me just very quickly switch gears entirely just to lay a benchmark down with respect to a wild card. Not on the, the not there's, there's not a significant change in demand for energy coming from EVs. There's a, there's a, a meaningful shift in the locus of energy demand, oil going to the mining sites instead of to your gas tank, if you like, to dig up materials for batteries. The biggest wild card in energy demand is not whether or not we have more EVs or fewer EVs in the future. It's meaningful. Don't get me wrong. It's meaningful, but it's not profound. The wild card is the introduction of new uh, machines that weren't used at scale before that take energy to fabricate and take energy to use. The, the four obvious categories for new classes of innovation that are only in, in small scale commercial use today, but are commercially used today, uh, are these three perhaps beyond obvious categories, drones, robots, bioelectronics, telemedicine, the cloud itself, AI, uh, virtual reality. Yeah, drones are no longer theoretical. There's, there's uh, It's a $10 billion market, global market. It's going to be at least 10 times that in, within the decade. Uh, drones deliver packages. They use for services, inspection, all manner of things. This is a wing copter drone, 10,000 of which are being deployed to Africa to deliver medicines. It doesn't matter whether they're battery powered or whether they're fuel powered. The big ones would be fuel powered, little ones are battery powered. They use energy, they use energy to fabricate, they use energy to uh, to operate. Same is true for robots, nascent market today. This is a Boston Dynamics spot. Um, it's about a $15 billion global industry. By, by robots, I mean mobile robots, wheeled, tracked, walking, ambulatory robots used in warehouses and uh, in construction sites. Telemedicine is the sort of bioelectronics are just now expanding. These are energy intensive uh, products and the cloud itself is the biggest single revolution of communications and computing uh, since the dawn of computing, which is broadly speaking, what I would call the cloud AI industry, maybe 20 billion today on track to be 10 times that within the decade. Again, everything requires energy to produce, everything requires energy to operate. To give you a sense of the energetics of drones, this is a, a map of the fuel you need on board uh, as you, and the power you need as you make the drone bigger. Uh, these are drones that exist, you know, kind of carrying small packages, not much energy, carrying a passenger, a fair bit of energy, bigger drones like military drones, which would be the same kind of scale we'd use for bigger packages or for multiple people, more energy. You'll see, uh, again, logarithmic curve here, uh, you know, put simplistically, you know, gravity's, uh, to use a technical term, gravity's a bitch. <laughs> you want to carry heavy weights, uh, uh, fight gravity, you use energy. In fact, the energy cost of convenience, air taxis, which, you know, where's my where's my flying car that's usually invective put against the forecasters and innovators? Flying cars are hard. Henry Ford predicted the flying car in 1920, 1920. 
He got it wrong by a century. Yeah, but you know, but he was right about the idea. There's a lot of convenience in dense urban areas for for flying, uh, you know, drones or uh, air taxis that can carry people. There come, there's about 150 companies around the world making uh, air taxis right now, not drones, but air taxis at different stages of development. These are four of the more better known, more prominent and well-funded uh, air taxi ventures. This, this is an interesting graph only because it shows you something that's important about a flying, a flying taxi instead of a driving taxi, if you like. Uh, if you go long distances, you can, you, can, you can make an air taxi that's as fuel efficient as a conventional car from driving distances of 100 miles. Uh, but if you use the air taxi for short distances where the things are congested below 50 miles, which is where the highest utility value would be, then their energy consumed per passenger mile, you can see on this graph, is a nonlinear function. It, it goes up uh, not just twofold, but as much as five or sixfold. So we'll see more air taxis. Convenience will come at the cost of energy. We're going to see the enabling of far more mobile robots. This is a, a history and forecast of uh, the use of mobile robots, which is wheeled, tracked, and ambulatory robots. Last year, we saw for the first time a million mobile robots sold on sold the market, most of them being sold into the materials and package handling business, which is warehouses, which is which were required by the magic of one-click shopping, e-commerce. The explosion in warehouses uh, grew much faster than the available labor, so we amplify labor with the robots. Robots, manufacturing robots is like manufacturing cars or complex machines require a lot of energy, and they also require energy to run. To do the same task, a robot uses more energy than a human. We just can't avoid that. It may seem like it doesn't, but trust me, it does. We're not even close to the uh, m making uh, uh, actuators that have the energetic efficiency of humans eating food and, and, and operating muscles through the magic of uh, bio biophysical chemistry. So the, the, the real revolution in, in transportation, if you like, in sort of mobility of stuff is uh, we had one of those, horses to cars, changing the food for the car matters, but it's not a revolution. But going to a robot era, uh, is a revolution. It's one that's nascent. It's one that's growing. It's one that will uh, be consequential economically and sociologically. It's also one that will have consequences in, in terms of energy markets. The other one, uh, quickly, that has energy consequences of some import, of course, is the ad advent of the cloud, which is the subject, uh, the sort of thread of my book, and the non-coincidence of the uh, arrival of artificial intelligence that can be enabled by the cloud. This is a graph uh, that tells you a lot about the demand for computing, and I'll get to the energetics of it in a second. The demand for computing comes from the fact that whatever the thing is that you're doing, that using the computational capacity of computers to do, it doesn't matter what the thing that you're doing is, you'll do more with computations if you can get more computations per second per dollar spent. So if you measure the underlying infrastructure of compute, and in terms of how many computations per second can I buy per dollar, whether it's at least online or whether it's buying capital equipment, it's all, it comes, it's all the same. It's computations per second per dollar. What you find is we've gone through three eras. We're in a new era that's really quite remarkable in terms of propelling demand for computational infrastructure. The first era of electromechanical computation, you know, adding machines, it got better. You know, engineers made the uh, machines 700% better per decade. That is, you got 700% more computations per second per dollar at the end of a decade than the beginning. This is pretty consequential. Imagine if you could get 700% more food produced per acre or per hour of labor uh, per the same dollar at the end of a decade. That would be that would be revolutionary. And when the electronic computing age came along, we saw that the rate of improvement jumped to almost 2,000% per decade. 2,000% more useful product computations per second per dollar spent. The cloud era accelerated that astronomically, literally. We have a thousand fold increase in the economic access uh, of computations per second per constant dollar in the cloud era. Essentially the utility function of the cloud has accelerated the cost efficacy of computing faster than Moore's law. To give you a sense of, of how impactful that is, consider this as a, a, a graph I concocted in my book Using the same kind of metric for transportation services as opposed to computing services, don't think in terms of computations per second per dollar. Think in terms of the fares you pay to transport goods or people, which you could measure in feet per hour per dollar. How many feet per hour 
do I get per dollar a fare that I use to buy passage on a ship or in a stagecoach or, on a, on a, or in a, a rail car or driving a car using a taxi or flying in an airplane? This, uh, this just shows you that over history, that the uh, cost efficacy of transportation, the engineering innovation has brought us a thousand fold improvement in the feet per hour per dollar you can buy over a period of a century. Now the cost efficacy of computing services is improving that fast in a decade. And you know that the revolution in transportation services, what that did to society over the century of roughly 18, you know, late, late 1800s, 1900 to the year 2000, the same thing is happening per decade now in computation services. Energy terms, by the way, that means you're going to build more infrastructure, build more data centers, more communication systems. Data centers are being built at an astonishing pace. There's, you can think of data centers like skyscrapers in, in, in 21st century and analog to 20th century. Uh, you know, Empire State class buildings, skyscrapers, there's about 1,500 of them in the, in the world. There's 5,000 enterprise class data centers. By that, I mean uh, buildings that have about a million square feet on a roof roughly half million to 2 million square feet on a roof. And we're building far more data centers, far faster than skyscrapers. A square foot of data center ironically costs about as much to build as a skyscraper, but they rent for five times as much because they can do a yes, higher economic utility function. What's interesting about them is that today's pre-AI data centers use 100 times more power per square foot. This is a graph of the total number of square feet of data centers being built every year in the last two decades in millions of square feet. And keep in mind the number I just said, 100 times more energy per square foot consumed by data centers compared to skyscrapers. And we're building millions of square feet uh, per year of these data centers. And now that's going to get accelerated. So by artificial intelligence, a a AI as an energy consumer of compute horsepower is the equivalent of going from a lime scooter to a semi-trailer. This is not like going from a car to an SUV. There's been a 300,000 fold increase in the amount of compute horsepower devoted to AI in the last six years. That is a 300,000 fold increase in compute power, the growth in six years. The rate at which compute power that is measured in petaflop days or bits per second or bits per hour, it, this is this it, exponential fails. There's, it, the growth rate, there's a log curve on your y-axis there. And we're, we're growing exponentially inside of an exponent, exponent. This is an astonishing growth rate in compute horsepower being devoted to AI. AI is made possible by powerful computing that's accessible to people through the cloud. And the fact that the cloud is expanding now to in, embrace AI is going to change the architecture of the cloud. This is Google's... Uh, you know, chief architect for this, and he's calling it a phase change in the infrastructure. Boy, you bet. This is, this is. Uh, there's no, there's no easy analog to think of. If if the electric utility industry uh, it did not go through anything comparable in terms of a phase change of this character, and when utility uh, infrastructure became possible starting in the early uh, 20th century, we radically increased the electrification of America from a sense of a few percent of homes being electrified to 100 percent. But the electricity consumed per household, uh, per function in the household, creeps down. Your lighting gets more efficient. Your electric motors get more efficient. The everything in the house gets more efficient. That is efficient. Fewer fewer kilowatt hours used per function, per lumen, per cooling hour. With computing, the kilowatt hours used per function is rising. That's what AI is doing, in, radically increasing it. So let's. I want to wrap up with just talking about the supply side. So on the supply side, that is the revolution in supply uh, is very different than the revolution in demand. So we have revolutionary changes coming in energy demand. We have, we have aspirations of revolutionary changes of energy supply that have never happened. And, you know, I'll cut to the chase, aren't going to happen. Uh, your, this left graph is uh, the share of U.S. energy that comes from all renewables, wind, solar, corn alcohol, uh, hydro dams, and nuclear power. And you can see that the, the big increase from 2000, from uh, roughly 7% of US energy from non-hydrocarbons to just over 11% now uh, is contemporaneous with the advent of uh, the ethanol policies that were put in place by uh, Bush 43 
and the wind and solar policies, which were started at the, around the same time. So we've increased it. But those dotted lines are the forecasts for the share of America's energy that would come from renewables made at different times. So basically, for the last 50 years, there's been very smart forecasters who have been saying that within 20 or 30 years, half of America's energy would come from renewables. That's never happened. And we're, we're being told that again. Uh, at this time, it's different, apparently. Well, it's not. Uh, and then we have forecasts like the one on the right, which is for the world to go to net zero, that is to use no hydrocarbons to produce energy. And the black line here is the share of all of world's energy that are supplied by non-hydrocarbon sources. Again, you know, uh, this is, in this case, by the way, it, it's a little finger on a scale. This includes wood uh, because it's, it is technically a hydrocarbon. It's more like a carbohydrate than a hydrocarbon. But you inverse, invert the chemicals, but it includes wood, wind, solar, nukes, hydropower. To get to a net zero by 2050, that is to, to get the world from about 17% of all energy coming from non-hydrocarbons to all, give you a sense of the scale, otherwise it's not going to happen. That would require building one 1,000 uh, megawatt nuclear power plant every single day for 30 years. Every single day, installing a new nuke, one gigawatt nuke. In wind terms, that's a thousand three megawatt wind turbines, each the size of the Washington Monument, built and installed every single day for 30 years. Uh, this is not happening. It's not going to happen. The physical construction requirements, uh, never mind mineral requirements, are not going to happen. So this is the state of play where the world is today. This is uh, roughly uh, the you know the pie chart shows you the share of uh, primary energy supplied to the world, the 21 percent quote non hydrocarbon slash renewables. The important thing here is context. All the world's wind and solar power combined, uh, as of the end of last year, this graph is a, is a little, probably a year, 14 months old, uh, managed to edge up towards 4% of world energy. Wind and solar, 20 years, five to five to $10 trillion of spending on non-hydrocarbons, and wind and solar are just shy of 4% of world energy. Wood, burning wood still supplies nearly 10% of world energy. Burning wood, the oldest known form of energy to, for humanity other than using muscles, uh, still is more than double all the world's wind and solar combined. This is not an accelerating transition. This is an addition to a, a menu of options for the world. To give you a context that I think is interesting and relevant to where I think wind and solar are going to go, just personal opinion, is if you map out the... Uh, the nuclear era from 1970 to 1990, which was the, the growth of commercial nuclear power, a heavily capital intensive, heavily subsidized industry globally, with the growth of the wind and solar industry combined from 2009, by the way, to forecast in the 2029. Same time period overlapped on the Y axis. Nukes starting in 1970, wind and solar starting in 2009. At that point in history, in 1970, the share of global electricity, not energy, Supplied by nuclear energy in 1970 was the same as a share of global electricity supplied by wind and solar in 2009. And their growth rates track. It's kind of interesting. So, you know, today, uh, the total electricity supplied by wind and solar pushed up to about 11%. Uh, we're on our way to 12%. Uh, uh, nukes peaked and started shrinking as a share of global electricity uh, for a combination of reasons. One was fear, safety issues, of course. Uh, the other was, I think, a, a subsidy exhaustion. Uh, governments uh, gave up on the amount of capital subsidies required for these capital intensive projects. I think when this all are going to follow the same path, I think we'll see continued expansion. Uh, the money, there's a lot of money in the pipeline. There will be subsidy exhaustion. There are capital intensive projects, and the the analog to uh, fear of uh, nuclear power and nuclear waste in the solar and wind uh, domains, of course, are all the opposition to the magnitude and scale uh, environmental damage and visual blight from you know square miles of of land covered uh, with solar panels and, and occluded, you know, sun blocking. And of course, the sheer scale of uh, wind, wind, uh, wind arrays at these uh, kind of demand levels. And uh, the other, to the point of subsidy exhaustion, this is a Bloomberg New Energy Finance graph showing the, the spending to date, trillions of dollars, y-axis, trillions of dollars. <laughs> so we've spent, we've spent, this is the, at an annual rate, we're spending more than a trillion a year globally, but it's mostly Europe and US. This is what they say the necessary funding is to, to make the uh, quote-unquote transition happen. 
uh, you can you can add up under that curve, and we could do the math here, right? This is not complicated. You're talking about something on the order of of three to four hundred trillion dollars of accumulated capital spending required uh, by 2050 to get the same product. Keep in mind the product is the same: the electrons, the BTUs, more than we're now spending. This is this is a crazy amount of money. Uh, this is why I talk about subsidy exhaustion. It's not going to happen. And we see it showing up in the cost of energy. The claim that wind and solar are cheaper is not true. It's not showing up in the, the only metric that matters. So the cost of electricity delivered to consumers going down. It is not. All across Europe on the EU grid, increased penetration in wind and solar is one-to-one -one correlated. Increased cost of grid electricity. Same is true in the United States. The right graph is the Excel uh, filings with the Public Service Commission showing what's happened in, over the last uh, 15 years and forecast into the next couple of years, that as the share of electricity from wind and solar has increased from a few percent on its way to a third, the cost of electricity to the average homeowner in that service territory has nearly tripled. Germany uh, experience, they've done the experiment for it. Not only do they have electricity that's two to 300% more expensive than in the United States, the share of the total primary energy supplied to the German economy from wind and solar is just 6%. After doubling the size of their electric grid in capacity terms and keeping most of the uh, existing grid online except for nuclear power, what Germany has achieved is a, a de minimis change in their primary consumption of, of hydrocarbons at scale. And this has come at an extraordinarily high cost. The reason that they had to keep the original grid running is beyond obvious, to keep the lights on when the wind isn't blowing and the sun is not shining. But we're being told now that we can solve this problem with batteries. In theory, that's true, but you need to calculate how many batteries you need to take into account the two factors that are important, not the third, no, the, the, well, three, the diurnal variability is obvious. Sunrise, sunset, wind is windier at night than the daytime. What's much more important for, for decadal periods are seasonal variabilities in the capacity factory, fast factor for wind and solar, and droughts of sun and wind. So this is a graph of actual seasonal variability of uh, wind capacity factors in California and the lower plains. It, the fact that you see capacity factors vary by a factor of two tells you that to deliver the same amount of energy, you need to build twice as many wind turbines, by definition, to have the same capacity off-peak and on-peak. Same is true for solar. This is um, this is the seasonal solar capacity factor. Number of hours of sunlight varies seasonally, depending on your latitude. So this is for the uh, uh, California grid, so, which is a fairly sunny, fairly sunny grid. Again, a 2x variability. So that means that every watt of solar uh, that you have on, that you calculate during the best season, you need two watts of solar in capacity on the worst part of the season. And you have to build that if you're going to use a mostly, mostly solar and wind grid. Then you also have to take into account wind droughts, that is periods of time, days and weeks long, which there is no wind. This is the Mid-Atlantic ISO graph from uh, 2020 two summer uh, where for 10 days, the total installed capacity was operating at about five or 10% of the rated capability. So if you didn't have backup power for that time period, you would have to uh, have turn the lights out or you could build batteries for, for the MISO grid to have batteries fill that 10 days would have required something on the order of a trillion dollars of uh, lithium batteries. So that's not going to happen. And at, at national scale, what we're being told is, well, you don't have to build that many batteries after all. What you would do is you build a super grid because it's always sunny somewhere. It's always windy somewhere sometime. Uh, well, no, that's not true, actually. It's not always sunny somewhere on the continent of the United States. And it's not always windy sunny, uh, windy somewhere sometime. We have uh, decades of mete meteorological data. Looking back in time over three decades of meteorological data, we can tell you how often there is a continent-wide wind drought. No wind anywhere. How often the entire continent of the United States is covered in clouds for the day that we called a solar drought. How often both of them occur simultaneously. That also happens periodically. Uh, it's happened more than a dozen times over the 30 years. So when that happens, uh, having transmission lines going from California to New York's are irrelevant. You're still going to need batteries. So what this computer model did is it modeled uh, a 
super grid, assume that the United States is fully integrated grid and you can ship your wind and solar power any way you want, anytime. What you'd want to know is how big of a grid would you need in compared to today's grid to provide the amount of power that we now provide on average over 30 years. And at the same time, how many days of storage would you need to fill the gap for the predicted, guaranteed to happen, wind and solar droughts that occur, especially the ones that can can occur contemporaneously. And what you want to do is meet the uh, the gold standard for a 30-year grid, not one day of total continent-wide blackout. You, you can't have more than one day of continent-wide blackout. That's 99.99% reliability. So this is what you find out. If you only wanted 12 hours of storage, national storage, with, again, I'll remind you, it's trillions of dollars of batteries, you still have to build a grid six times the size of the current grid, and you'd need to build transmission systems to fully integrate that grid. So you need trillions of dollars of transmission, trillions of dollars of storage, and a grid that's not one watt for one watt replaced, but you need six watts of wind and solar for every watt of hydrocarbons you take off. This is an astonishing cost. It's an, an astonishing large engineering project, and one that, uh, you know, it sounds like hyperbole, won't happen. It's not going to get built. Well, it's going to happen, though, we're going to try to do it. We're going to use lots of minerals. This IEA data showing that wind and solar use 1,000 to 2,000% more mined minerals per unit of energy delivered to society. We know that that means there's going to be a 700% to a 4,000% increase in global demand for those minerals. We also know that the global mining industry is not now investing in that level of expansion. In fact, this Wood McKenzie graph of historic and forecast CapEx by the global mining industries shows a, a continual decline. There's been a somewhat uh, modest increase in some sectors, but basically the investment required to meet the current plans to build wind, solar, and batteries is the hashed green bars. That is that is not what's being invested. That's what's needed to be invested. The average mine takes 16 years to open. The world's going to need hundreds of new mines to build the batteries, the windmills, and solar arrays. The world is not now building those mines. It's not, as if, it's not that there's not enough copper on the planet. It's that the world is not, does not mining enough copper nor is the world planning to mine enough copper. And if the world tries to mine that much copper, which we might do, it will cause a historic increase in inflation in, in metals and minerals prices. The IMF did a calculation based on this and concluded that the meeting the net zero aspirations will cause, in their words, a historic increase in historic inflation in metals and minerals prices greater than it has been seen at any time in a century of recorded history of, of metals pricing. Last thing I'll point out is uh, where the metals are mined and where they're refined. They're not mined in America, but more importantly, they're not refined here. You don't just mine copper and lithium and graphite. You have to refine it after you mine it. The majority of energy minerals refining takes place in China. China has a market share ranging from 40 to 85% of global supply of energy minerals. This is IEA data, again, showing uh, the market concentration in oil refining and LNG export, because LNG is essentially the an analog, if you like, for refining natural gas. To make natural gas useful elsewhere, other than pipes domestically, you have to make it LNG. So the market concentration by the three top producers of oil, re oil refining and LNG is lower than the market concentration for all the energy minerals with the dominant player it's again, China. This is going to be very difficult to reverse this. doesn't matter what kind of tariffs you put on this. It takes decades to build these kinds of infrastructures, certainly a decade. I would say, setting aside the geopolitical point of this, I would say it is profoundly naive to believe that China will never exercise pricing power on this. Uh, OPEC has one half the market share in oil that China has in energy minerals. To think that they'll never uh, exercise market pricing power Again, I, I will, I, I'll make the prediction. They'll, they'll exercise market pricing power. <laughs> You'd be crazy not to. In, in the United States, the uh, setting aside refineries, the number of mines that have been approved in general have been, has been in free fall for a long time. This is just for the last uh, decade. Uh, the mine uh, approvals uh, briefly ticked up under the uh, Trump administration, and then went back into 
free fall. And in this administration, there's been at least three, I think four uh, mine permits that went through multi years and millions of dollars of regulatory approval that were summarily novated by the administration. Uh, I think those will get reversed legally because it's a violation of their of of due process. But you know the the presidents of those mining companies know that they're going to have to spend millions more in litigation uh, with the federal government to get those uh, permit reversals reversed. Last point I'll I'll leave with is sort of circling back to where I started that I think the demand issue is the one that people are missing. Uh, we're going to need lots of electric vehicles because the demand for more cars is greater than I think the world really wants to supply with internal combustion engines. So we're going to need both. We're going to need lots of wind and solar because the demand for energy for oil and gas is, is, is off the charts great for this simple fact. Most of the world is underserved in energy. Increase the GDP per capita and you increase the quantity of energy used per capita. This is an iron law. It's unchanged. You can slightly reduce this with efficiencies, but you don't change it in any profound way. The majority of the world lives in the left bottom quadrant of this graph, as everybody knows. Billions of people use one-tenth as much energy per capita as the uh, Western world. If they only get to a quarter as much energy per capita as we use, because they're so efficient compared to us, this will more than double the world's demand for energy. To supply that, the world's going to need you know, to use the line that was infamously created by, and then of course pilloried uh, by President Obama, the world is definitely going to need all of the above. This is clearly what the world's going to need. It's not anti-oil or anti-lithium battery or anti-EV pro internal combustion engine. All will be required. All will be needed to serve the social, economic, and cultural requirements of a world that wants things that they don't have from medical care, to education, to opportunity to fly an airplane and own a vehicle in the first place and have the luxury of taking a vacation. Billions of people don't live that way. Billions of people want to live that way. I dare say billions of people will live that way and they'll be served by a greater supply of all forms of energy. In fact, even, even wood is not shrinking at the moment. The consumption of wood is rising. Uh, in part, that's an artifice of silly roles in Europe, which allow American wood pellets to be be called green energy when they're coal fired with coal. So I'll end with that uh, as a sort of the, uh, uh, could, we, could I call it a masterclass picture of supply and demand? All right. Very good. Uh, yeah. I don't want to keep you too long, but I do have one question. Uh, the uh, Your podcast, which I've listened to, is called The Last Optimist. And then your <laughs> new book is called The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a roaring 2020s. So do you have any elevator pitch as to why you believe those things? <laughs> I know, one of the most common questions. So so when's the roaring gonna start already? Come on, you know. Uh, so uh, first, optimism doesn't mean naivete or lack of realism. Uh, op optimism is, is born on the uh, belief that we'll sort things out and not that we naively can't Sovietize an economy. We know economies can be Sovietized and destroyed because the Soviets did that. And uh, Russia is still in the shambles because, because of that. China is on track to Sovietizing its economy, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll damage it. We'll see how that experiment goes. But in the Western world, especially in the United States, we have a very long history of turmoil. And most people who think that we're in a unique period of turmoil have never read their history. So I begin my book with a, a reminder of what was going on in the 1920s. Uh, we, we had a pandemic that ran three cycles from 1918 into, into 1920 and 21. It killed four times more people per capita and it killed the young, preferentially, not the old. We, we had come out of a world war, which was horrific in every sense, the advent of chemical warfare. We had massive uh, political debates going on, race riots that resulted in martial law, shutdowns of cities. We had uh, labor riots, which led to people being killed, shot. We had uh, it, it, the list goes on. I mean, you read what was going on, the Red Scare, the, the, the disruption of our, of our political system, the yellow journalism where people were lying and just making stuff up. It's crazy. There were 20,000 newspapers in America, probably 18,000 of them were just making total fake news. Uh, so you, you know, go to Wikipedia for a sort of a reasonably accurate snapshot of the 1920s, if you like. Yet 
the world survived another world war. Uh, we survived a lot of chaos. We, and the United States in particular, saw a 700% increase in real wealth per capita over the rest of the 20th century. I think we're at a pivot point in history like exactly like that, both culturally and socially. The turmoil is intense. I'm not naive about the politics of our day and the, what we feel like about Trump or not Trump and Biden and not Biden. People forget how emotional it was at different times. And even in our own recent history, we forget those things because we don't read them. It's human nature to sort of... <laughs> so the optimism then is we've been there before and it's been worse before, believe it or not. We've worked it out. So the political sphere, I think, gets sorted out. I think there's hints of it sorting out. It doesn't mean the next election is going to be exactly what you or I want or anybody listening wants. I, we tend to sort these things out because we want to. I, I immigrated to the United States as a Canadian because I like the I like the politics of this country. It doesn't mean I like the fracas or the chaos. I like the system of sorting it out because there's no perfect system, obviously. So we'll sort it out. I'm optimistic because history has shown we've sorted it out in the past. So the evidence that we can do it again is based on history. This, it's not a guarantee, but the evidence is really good. Similarly, the evidence that new technologies generates wealth uh, and well-being and improvements in quality of life is obvious in history, right? I mean, everybody knows that. But my book's point is to, is to demonstrate the evidence that we're at a pivot in new technologies as consequential in economic social terms as they were in the 1920s. And that's just the essential thesis of my book is not to make forecasts about things that have just been invented or can't happen. I'll use the robot again. Amendatory robots have been imagined since Greek legends. It's, it's not a new idea. Uh, the word robot was created by the Czech playwright, right? Almost exactly a hundred years ago last year. Robots have been imagined. Ambulatory robots that can work with people are cobots, collaborate with people, do useful things, amplify our labor, which is what all automation always does, are not commercial. They're not theoretical. Yes, there's only a million of them sold. We need to, we need to sell hundreds of millions of them if it's a business, but we've, it's begun. So my whole book's thesis is not about what we've invented tomorrow, right now, but what was invented 10 or 20 years ago, 3D printing that's just now maturing to have high utility function. That's when revolutions begin in social and economic terms. That's where we are. We're at the end of the beginning of the next great cycle. You know, if you like the great efflorescence of a new wave of productivity generating technologies, the energy implications of that are interesting. As I said, it takes energy to make things and operate them. But the more relevant energy implication is that it expands wealth. If you expand wealth, there's more people who want to take a vacation using the old stuff, flying. I mean, you can make the airplanes more efficient, but maybe I can make an airplane, let's just pick a number, 30 to 50% more efficient. But the number of people flying and their air miles being flown will go up 300%. So you'll get a, a muted growth, which is what efficiency does, but you still get growth. So I think the combination of those, those factors, the optimism that we will repeat the past, you know, History rhymes; it doesn't repeat. So we will, we will, we will, we'll get through it, and there'll be, it will be not. It won't. Doesn't mean it'll be easy to get through it. Doesn't mean people shouldn't be fighting for what they think are their rights. Uh, we'll get through it. We've done it before. But I, when I write my book, it's not about politics. I, I sort of want to paint a picture of what the stakes are to get through. We want to unleash this kind of innovation, which you might imagine I'm biased in this sense. The government's not really good at picking what's going to win or lose in innovation territory. So my my political bias is to allow markets to function within the boundaries that we agree on of safety and environmental impacts within reasonable boundaries. And let markets function. The more governments say this is what the market should do, the, the, the more we delay the growth and the closer we get to Sovietizing the economy, which would be bad. So I don't see evidence of, of us getting Sovietized. I see people who would like to do that. Self-professed socialists and communists would love to Sovietize our economy. They say that. It's not me insulting them. They, they write that. I hope they lose. I think they'll lose. And it looks like they are losing. But, you know, the sign of the loss is like the, uh, you know, it's like, like Cro-Magnum man going, hunting the uh the the woolly mammoth the beast and you and you gore the beast 
uh, it it bleeds out it bleeds out slowly and thrashes. You 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 got to be careful during the thrashing phase. That's a long answer to why I'm optimistic, but I feel like I have to. <laughs> I I'm I'm opt there'll be lots more EVs. I'm uh, but there will be. I'm very pessimistic in this sense. We're we're going to waste a lot of money trying to force EVs on people that don't want to buy them, and that's not good. But you know, we're a rich economy, so I would say we can afford the experiment, as long as it's just an experiment. And if it works out, okay, I've been wrong. If it doesn't work out, I've been right, and we'll have wasted a few hundred billion dollars. I think that's kind of immoral, but I do also think it's a it's the price we pay for an, uh, for a, a quasi democratic system where we try. We try stuff out, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time in America for the last couple hundred years has worked out pretty pretty well. But again, through periods of real trial real and real chaos, and I think we're in one of those periods, which is, again, ironic. 1920s were, began the same way, uh, off a of World War, uh, Red Scare. I mean, Russia was a problem then. It's a problem now. <laughs> we... <laughs> we we debated our politics, you know, at least we don't do duels with real guns anymore. I guess that's probably good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, making me feel better. And uh, it was a <laughs> great presentation. And uh, I appreciate your time. We'll talk to you next time. Mark P. Mills. Goodbye. Thank you, Tom.